podcast is brought to you by Aldis International, supplying your expert AI and digital transformation staffing needs across the US and Europe. Today, you are listening to our AI in Action series, where leading minds in AI from across the world share their story, success, and advice. AI in Action cuts through the hype and explores the true impact of artificial intelligence in our world today. You're listening to AI in Action. I'm your host, JP Valentine. Our guest today is John Peterson. John is the VP of Data Science at Archer. John, welcome to the show. Hey, JP. It's great to uh, be with you. Thanks for having me. John, we've got an exciting interview and episode today, but let's start with yourself, please. Could you give us a a bit of a background and an overview of your journey in technology from where you got started, some of the roads you've held along the way? Take us up to today as the VP of Data Science at Archer. So I began my career actually really drawn to economics way back from my freshman year in college, I thought that economics was really useful and fun to help explain the world around us. So I was pretty adamant that was going to be my future. My first job out of college, I got a job at the research department at one of the Federal Reserve Banks. And I was actually picking which grad program I wanted to join. And just out of nowhere, I had this epiphany that I loved the math and the rigor of economics, but I wanted to use it to something that was maybe a little more tangible and relevant to life. Someone told me about, you know, this field called operations research, which is some one I've never even heard of before. And to this day, it's probably a lot less known than a lot of other types of disciplines around data science. But I looked into it. I loved the methodology. It looked very similar to what I had, was used to. I love the multidisciplinary nature of the field, drawing from math and statistics business, engineering, computer science. And what really excited me was seeing the profound impact operations research had across a host of domains. So I decided that's what I wanted to do. Went to grad school in in OR. And when I was doing my PhD, I was really drawn to aviation applications of the technology. So airlines use optimization for everything with how they set their timetables to how they schedule their crew members how they price their itineraries, how they do their maintenance. It's just rife with really fun and rich, hard to solve problems that were really important. (laughs) If an airline is flying seven flights between Chicago and Nashville, and there's only demand for, I don't know, three or four, you're going to be in trouble because the cost of operating aircraft is quite high. So graduated, I was working in kind of aviation applications for a few years, mostly on the operations side, which was really fun. And new. And I, you know, was having a lot of fun, but I wanted to have impact. And aviation is a pretty stable, fairly mature industry. And for, you know, I think some process-driven reasons that it's a little bit more difficult to see your work through pr- to production on many things. And so someone from Uber actually reached out to me and asked if I'd be interested. And this was in, you know, at the start of 2015. And I was really interested in the, I, I loved the Uber product. I was interested in what Uber could do for cities and what ride sharing can do more generally. So I decided to make the leap and I joined Uber and worked initially on the Uber Pool team, which was a technology I was a huge fan of personally and also really fun from a kind of a, the product was just getting spun up and really scaling to other cities. So what I love the tech environment almost immediately. Going from a whiteboard to production was so much easier to do. And I also loved doing experimentation. It was not uncommon where I would design an experiment launch it, go for coffee, come back, and you have a result. You have a fairly conclusive result. So that ha- that fast iteration was totally new to me and also really fun. So my love of tech and aviation also actually happened to meet up when I was at Uber, and they were spinning up a new program called Uber Elevate. And that team was exploring the possibility of adding a new mode of transportation eventually in the f- to, to the app to help people basically summon a flight on demand. (laughs) It was a pretty radical concept at the time. I dug in, I saw, wow, this technology has a lot of promise. And that's how I kind of got into this space of what's called advanced air mobility or AAM. And now I find myself at Archer and have having a lot of fun. Been here about two years now. Amazing. Thank you so much for sharing your story, John. And it, it really is a great story to tell from early interest to deciding what impact you wanted to have and allowing the, your strengths in technology to, to follow in line with your interests. And now you've landed at Archer. So perfect segue from the work you've done at Uber. But for people listening who are not familiar, tell us all about Archer, who you are, what you do, mission of the business. 
So Archer was founded in 2018. We're headquartered in the Bay Area. And our mission is to revolutionize the future of what we call urban air mobility or UAM. And what UAM is a, an emerging ecosystem that will enable safe, sustainable, and affordable transportation solutions to communities that are really heavily impacted by traffic congestion. I don't think I need to motivate this too much to your listeners. I think everyone's probably well aware, but many large cities around the world are really struggling to keep up with their transportation infrastructure to higher demand brought about by increased levels of urbanization. By the way, this problem is expected to worsen. The UN estimates that 70% of the world's population will live in and around urban centers by 2040, which is up from the just north of 50% that we see today. So this is going to exacerbate an obvious problem today. So what urban air mobility seeks to do, as I mentioned, is introduce a whole new type of aircraft, one that will take off vertically like a helicopter today and then fly in forward flight, much like a traditional aircraft. And we believe that these aircraft will be substantially beneficial to dense urban environments to enable a new mode of transportation, saving people a considerable amount of time. So what Archer is doing, we are designing, building, and then ultimately will be operating a fleet of these eVTOL aircraft in cities around the world. And so just really quickly, these aircraft, sometimes when I mention this to someone hearing it for the first time, they think that this is like a helicopter. This is actually profoundly different from helicopters. And it's really important to let people know because they're typically anchored to helicopters. The advantages of eVTOL aircraft are many. First of all, they are enabled by something called distri distributed electric propulsion or DEP. As its name suggests, this basically distributes the propulsion technology of a helicopter. So it's not one rotor, it's multiple rotors distributed on the aircraft. And that has a lot of advantages. First of all, a significant safety advantage whereby there is no single points of failure on these aircraft. Helicopters today, by the way, have over 100 single points of failure on the lifting rotor alone. So if a rotor, for whatever reason, is inoperable on one of our aircraft, the aircraft can still fly. Second of all, because of this redundancy, we're able to actually spin the rotors at a much slower rate than what helicopters operate at. And that has the significant benefit of much lower noise of aircraft. Not only is the noise lower, but it is more of a broad broadband noise as opposed to a tonal noise, which makes it a lot less annoying as well. And so we think that these aircraft will blend into kind of the city soundscapes today. And because of that, we think that these aircraft can operate in dense urban environments, unlike helicopters today, which usually op operate on the periphery of a city. And then finally, because of the much of this technology, we believe that this can actually scale over time and really be an affordable means of transportation, not just catered to the elite, but catered to a wide subset of the population in cities. And that's to me what really is inspiring to me. Amazing, amazing. Look, anyone who's come across some of the branding and marketing material for Archer will instantly be impressed by the design of the vehicle, but also the potential near-term impact and use cases for it, which we'll get to in a moment when we talk about what the roadmap lo looks like. But for now, talk us through your role as the VP of Data Science, because a lot of what you're dealing with here is there's multiple parts of the business from hardware, software, optimization, route planning, you oversee all of that. So can you give us a bit of a look behind the scenes of your role, your team, and, and some of the various things that you're working on? Yeah, I'm happy to. So my team is, we have the great advantage of getting to work with virtually every team at Archer to provide data science solutions to help enable them. So we have the great pleasure to interact very closely with our world-class engineering team to actually size our aircraft. There are, you know, well over 300 different entities around the world who are trying to make variations of this aircraft. And there's a pretty broad spectrum of these aircraft. So what we try to do is we want to make sure that we're using machine learning and optimization to design the right aircraft to serve the intended missions. So doing things like trade-offs between the speed or the range or the payload of the aircraft is really important so that we're designing the aircraft to serve the missions that we're expecting. That's hard because we don't have great data on that today, obviously. So that's one application. We also do a number of trade studies with our world-class battery team to size the chargers, for instance, to try to optimize the charging of these aircraft. We work closely with our business development team and we just ha ha hired our head of airline operations. So we work with them very closely to select the cities that we want to serve select the routes in the cities and do all sorts of interesting trade studies. And so we've got a lot of really exciting announcements in the pipeline here 
to announce what some of these uh, initial routes and cities are, which we're excited to share at some point. And so, yeah, what we're trying to do is really plan for operations. Once we intend to launch our operations in 2025, and there we'll be providing a lot of critical services to fulfill trip requests. So when one wants to take an archer from point A to point B, there's a lot of really interesting challenges around how to price the service, how to pool riders together. This will be a ride sharing service how, and how to dispatch the flights, et cetera. And so there's just a host of really interesting applications that we're very excited to, to lean into. You are listening to the Aldis Podcast. When you're looking to scale your team or if you are interested in showcasing your company in a future episode, reach out today. Or if you're in the market for a new role, visit our website to view open positions, www.allthis.com. You and I were speaking previously about some of the challenges, very unique challenges that you face in, in trying to bring this business to a reality. The main one being that the lack of available related data. Can you speak about why that's so challenging and what you and the team in Archer are doing to overcome those challenges? Yeah, great question. I think when one is trying to design an ecosystem for which there is no obvious data today, it's a significant challenge. And so there's a pretty wide array of different ways one can use data. One approach is not use data at all and rely on conjecture, which I think some entities might be doing. We take the point of view that we are launching a complete new airline from scratch. We're making decisions today about cities, routes, vehicle design, chargers, things like that, that have a profound impact on the health of the business. And you have essentially no recourse. Once you decide to build infrastructure out of site, it is likely to persist for a long time. And so we think that we should be on the complete opposite side of the spectrum and really invest heavily in data-driven technologies, which is a challenge because of what you mentioned. So I think there are a few things that we could still add value with data. First of all, I think it's to separate the things that you cannot control from those that you can. So we might not be able to, with 100% precision forecast demand, but we can partner with our vehicle engineering team, for instance, to know exactly how long a flight will take and how much energy will be discharged from the battery. And so by controlling those things that you can control, I think you really help reduce the propagation of uncertainty imposed by what you cannot control. So that's just one thing, working closely with domain experts, getting everything else right as much as possible. Second of all, I think you need to be sometimes creative with what data can be useful. So we don't know how the public is exactly going to respond to this new technology today, but we do have pretty good data on how people move today on the ground in 2D. So by using, by, by, building our models and calibrating with what is known just to show that, hey, we can actually replicate what we know today can really help build stakeholder confidence, I think, and help, again, help increase the confidence in the fidelity of our models. Um, finally, I think it's really important to know that decisions are oftentimes not made as point estimates, but oftentimes they're the accumulation of thousands and thousands of runs with different parameters and different information that's both endogenous and exogenous. For instance, we can't wait for the FAA to have every single requirement about vertiport standards. So we have to consider a wide array of different outcomes. So a lot of times it's not picking a solution. It's trying to find the conditions under which a solution is stable. So there's a lot of there's a lot of really interesting techniques from the data science and optimization worlds to help increase the robustness of solutions so that the solution that you're delivering is amenable to different realizations of uncertainty. So those are just some of the principles that we try to factor in when we design our models. Obviously, this is an incredibly exciting space and really speaks to use of AI on the bleeding edge of technology. You're essentially creating a new form of transportation and a new industry. For someone like yourself, who's always been passionate about aviation and has come from that background, it's a no brainer, right? But for others, they're, they may be not quite as convinced or a little uncertain, seeing the overall value may not be so sure that it's something that's realistic. As somebody who's on the inside, you've a much better perspective of just how realistic this is. And it's not a potential, this is happening and it's coming in the near term. Can you speak both to how soon we can see this becoming a reality, but then for uh, AI and data professionals who are curious about maybe this is an area I would may want to work in the future. What could you tell them to convince them about, look, this is happening, it's coming, get on board now because you will look back in a few years and, and be really happy that you've done so. 
So I first started to dip my toes into the into the interesting world of urban air mobility in 2016. And we were seen as kooks. And I was I was among the, <laughs> the many skeptics at first. I think it's been really fun to see the industry mature to where it has. A number of companies have gone public. You actually see a number of vehicles fly. Archer is among them. We have a demonstrator aircraft that's flying virtually every day. The FAA is very much leaned in to this ecosystem and other regulatory bodies around the world are very collaborative. It is not too difficult to find a whole host of interesting articles. And there are a number of publications now that really that are very active in this space. So yeah, feel free to give us a follow. Either Archer or the community at large, there, there are no, there's no shortage of great information. I think what you're going to see is a lot, of, a lot of advancements in what we call a public acceptance. It's one thing to have these aircraft operating. It's another thing to introduce these to the public. And I think what you're going to see is a lot more of an outreach from OEMs and other service providers in this industry to really start to introduce these more to the public, maybe by doing some flights in and around urban centers, potentially. So this thing is getting very real. I couldn't be more excited. And yeah, in terms of the applications of AI, ML, optimization, there are many. This is a whole new industry for which the technology is very well suited to design aircraft, um, design air, the airspace and operate in dense urban airspace to operate the actual service. The interesting, the a applications are many and it is a very exciting space to be in. It's just a lot of fun. It's fun to be around hardware and software. And yeah, the, you've got a very exciting future ahead. Final question from me then, John, when you look ahead at the project roadmap and you start to visualize the date when we're doing regular commercial flights in operation, what are some of the things that you're most excited about between now and then? And sec part two of that question is when we're at the point where th this is available to the public, how big is your data team going to need to be? What sort of growth are we looking at? Just so we can give people an insight into the opportunity that there could be for them to join along that journey. Yeah, absolutely. Regarding our kind of launch strategy, we plan to launch commercial operations in 2025. I, I can't quite touch on every single announcement that we're about to make, but we have a lot of exciting announcements that are in our pipeline that we'll be releasing here shortly. In the coming years, I think you're going to see a lot of engagement with the public of these aircraft. We're doing more and more interesting flights, really expanding our flight envelope. Archer is pretty transparent with different milestones that we're reaching and feel free to give us a follow. You'll be able to follow along these interesting milestones and see the different types of flights that we're doing, which are getting more and more interesting by the day. As I mentioned, from building AI solutions with respect to our aircraft or our airline operations, the opportunities for AI are immense. And we are going to have a number of interesting roles become available over time. This is a very important part of the organization for which we're very fortunate that our leadership has been so supportive. And yeah, we'll absolutely be growing and supporting a number of different business units here at Archer in the future. John, thank you so much for coming on today and talking to us from previous conversations that you and I have had. This has been a, an episode I've been very much looking forward to doing. What you're building at Archer is really revolutionary and very exciting. And I can't wait to be a passenger at some point in some time in the near future. But the use of AI and data science is fascinating and it's only going to continue to grow. So we wish you, the team and everyone at Archer the best of luck in months and years to come and look forward to having you back on the show a year or two from now. Thanks, JP. And we look forward to welcoming you on an Archer flight. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Oldest Podcast. If you enjoyed today's episode, don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review. We are available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and any Android podcast of choice. You can also head over to our website, www.aldis.com, to listen to more podcasts, view our open roles, and stay up to date with industry news. Thanks for listening and stay tuned for more great episodes coming very soon.